Good morning. I am so fired up. I know I say that every week, but I really, really, really am fired up, and I hope you are. You know, last week we looked at quit playing it safe, and you saw me put a helmet on and hug a balance beam, a la Francis Chan. Today we take the fear factor and we up it one notch, okay? Today there was a girl, and she was terrified, and she was standing at the top of a high structure, and this beautiful, precious, gorgeous, autistic nine-year-old girl had climbed all the way up several dozen flights of stairs to something that looked like this. This is what I call the water slide of death. What happens in this is you get to the top, you enclose yourself into this capsule of death, you cross your arms, goodbye, and when you think you're ready, you give a thumbs up to the guy on the outside of the enclosure who has a button. And when he presses the button, a trap door underneath your feet falls away and you plummet to your death, basically, right? That's what it is. Here's what it looks like when they hit the button, okay? Now, obviously, that's not the sweet nine-year-old girl we're talking about. This girl is the daughter of filmmaker Dallas Jenkins. If you're familiar with Dallas, we've shown a couple of his films. I think one of them here, we've shown What If here on the left. This one on the right, awesome movie just in the theater. We're going to show it as a family movie night next month, so get ready. It is awesome. And I, I was talking to Dallas. We've become friends through Facebook, and I asked permission to share this story, and he said, absolutely. So he gave me permission to share this, and what happened was they get to the top of this dizzying height, and they're looking out over the, the park. And what seemed like a good idea to his daughter, who was really excited, she thought she wanted to go, she gets to the top and she freaks out. And that's pretty normal. A lot of us would probably freak out as well. So she gets in, closes the enclosure, and says, no, I can't do it, I can't, no thumbs up, no thumbs up, do not hit the button. And she gets out, she goes back over to Dallas. This happens half a dozen times. Dallas pulls her aside and says, sweetie, we've been over this. We had an agreement that if we climbed those stairs... The only way we are going down is on that slide. That's it. That is our only way down. Now, I will not force you to do this until you're ready, but that's our way home. <laughs> okay? She would cry. They would go in. They would get out of line. They'd let others go. They'd get back in. Finally, a full 30 minutes go by. And she's soothing herself, and he's talking to her and saying, I'm here for you. You're going to feel so good once you conquer this fear. I promise you may not like it, but you will feel good at the other end of this. She gets back into the tube. She shuts the door. She makes a sign of the cross. <laughs> she gives a thumbs up, and the guy counts down. Three, two, one. Boom. And the trap door releases, and she plummets. Dallas goes down and greets her, and it is one of the happiest moments of his parenting career. A parenting win. Not so much for her. She did not enjoy it. But she was so proud of herself that she faced that fear. See, she got out of the boat. And they've been able to go back and refer to this moment on multiple occasions, Dallas said, where they go, baby, don't panic. You remember the slide? You remember how good you felt that you accomplished it? You may not want to do it again, but you knew you could do it. And it built trust within them. Just like it builds trust with us and our Lord. When we step out of the boat, we looked at last week with Peter. He got out of the boat and he walked on water. And I face my fears. And I confess to you, let's just say hypothetically that maybe somebody had an irrational fear of the Incredible Hulk chasing him in his nightmares. And that person had to face his fears and watch that movie and, and have therapy for it. Perhaps you've had a, a dream of skydiving. Maybe it's time to take that leap. Remember, you don't have to have a parachute to skydive. You need a parachute to skydive twice. I'll let you get that one on the way home. All right, that was, that was a freebie. That's a test to see if you're awake. Maybe you want to always climb that cliff. Maybe you've got a fear of heights. Think about this. When you climb the cliff, when you have nothing left but God, we discover that God is enough, but we still shouldn't sit on cliffs like that. That is just dumb. <laughs> Don't do that. This is not, hear me, this is not about taking risks for risk's sake. Okay, this is safety pup talking to you here. We only want what's best, what is, we're supposed to pray and use godly discernment when we take our risks, okay? It's not about just being crazy, woohoo, let's do this, all right? Now, the good news is there are several awesome steps that Scripture tells us that we can dismantle this idol of fear and this safety at all cost mentality that a lot of us have, myself included. So I want to look at it. The first one we looked at last week 
was stop saying no to everything just because it's scary. And I shared with you a very personal story. And had I said no, I wouldn't be standing here today. But I took that step of faith, even though I knew this was, well, I thought this was not what God had for my life. I would not trade these last 25 months for anything. What is it that God is calling you? Outside the box, outside that comfort zone. When that bubble of fear starts to press in and you get your elbows up and you start blocking out, what is it? What is God tugging at your heart to do that maybe set you up for the first day of the best run of your life? Because it's never too late. The second point we look at today, realize what's at stake. This is so important that we get the heavenly perspective, that we get our tunnel vision blinders off, our own little myopic world, and we start looking at the greater picture for the kingdom. What is at stake? Perhaps the four most depressing words we can hear in the English language are, it's just too late. My ship has passed. My time has passed. I'm too old. I'm too messed up. I can't, God can't use me. It's just too late. You see, for Moses, that was almost the case. I want to set the context for what we're about to read. So turn with me to Exodus 14. We're going to look at the scripture, but don't read it yet, okay? Let me set the context for it. While you pull up Exodus 14, let me welcome those who are joining us online. If you're streaming with us, it is great to have you with us too. Exodus 14, here's what's happened up to this point. Moses is an escaped felon. He's a murderer. He's, he's a guy who has killed a guy trying to do God's work in his own way. And he's on the run. He's hiding out in the wilderness, this runaway murderer. And by all accounts, let's just be honest, he is a total has-been. But despite thinking that he was washed up, Moses got to hear God's call from a burning bush. And he hears God's voice, and he obeys. He goes back to Egypt, and he deals with the most powerful man possibly in the world at the time, Pharaoh. And he goes back and forth, what I like to call a, a, a heavyweight boxing match for 10 rounds. You like that, Plague? How about that one? Boom. And he goes back and forth. Finally, the Pharaoh gives up and says, go. <laughs> Take your people and skedaddle. And Moses goes. So like, oh, victory, right? And he goes, and he runs smack into a dead end. Did that ever happen? Come to a dead end. He comes to the Red Sea. He's hemmed in on both sides, can't go forward. And he sees this massive army coming behind. And Moses does what all of us would do. He stops. He stops moving forward because he thinks the path is closed. And then something bizarre happens. I think it's the only time in Scripture where we can look, where we see God say to somebody, stop praying. <laughs> stop praying to me. Let's read what happens next, starting in verse 15 there. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Pick up your staff and raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on soggy ground. Did you say that? On dry ground. God even took care of the way the earth was set after this water. Think about this. God didn't say stand still. He didn't say move sideways. He said move forward. Why are you praying to me, Moses? Here's the plan. Pick up your staff. Raise your hand, divide the water, go. And it is a powerful moment. Moses does that, and we see the, the sea split. I think April found an actual photo of that day. She was there with her iPhone, and there it is. Charlton Heston was part of it. We didn't know that, but there's the proof of it. And the sea split, and then what happens? They cross. Moses says, wave that wand one more time, and the waves come crashing back in, and they destroy the Israelites. I mean, the Egyptians are soon having to learn how to swim right? With armor on and horses and chariots attached to them. And it doesn't go well for them. God not only provides a path of escape, he takes care of the enemies. And it's an incredible, beautiful illustration of God's power. Think about this. Moses' best moments happened only when he said yes to God. In other words, when he stopped saying no, when he stopped making excuses, when he stopped saying, man, it's too late, I'm too old, I can't, I've sinned too much, I've met, God, you can't use me. What if people knew what I'd really done? All those excuses, when he finally started saying yes to God, and he took that risky step, when he got out of his boat, look what happened. The moment he said yes, two million people walked out of slavery free. The moment he said yes, he gets to go and see the seas part, two million people escape Pharaoh on dry land, he receives the Ten Commandments. He gets to write the first five books of what we would call the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of our Bible today. He experiences the miracles of manna, Sinai. He gets to climb the mountain. He gets to 
behold God's glory so much that his face glows like a neon light. And he's got to hide it because it was slowly fading over the day. I mean, this is incredible. Nobody else had that. But the best years of his life happened only after he said yes. Here's the, here's the first nugget for us. When you say yes to God, that's when the incredible things start happening. Where are you? Have you been there? Are you there now? Are you on that precipice? Are you praying through this? Which one are you going to be? The one who doesn't say yes to much because it's scary and it's risky? I'm not, again, I'm not talking about taking risk for risk's sake. We saw that on the thing. That's just dumb. We don't sit on cliffs just to tempt fate. But when God calls, do we obey? Do we know his voice? Do we recognize it? If you really want to take your faith to the next level, if you really want a sense of purpose, and you really want a sense of adventure, if you really want to dismantle the idol of safety, then you need to brace yourself for this next step. Don't show it yet. Don't show it yet. I want to ask you something. Are you ready to see this next one? If you're ready, say, ready, Pastor. Oh, you are so not ready for this. <laughs> if you're ready, say ready, Pastor. Ready. Okay. Remember, you said you were ready. You asked for this, okay? I'm not going to spend long on here, but I want to touch on one point. If you really want to conquer your fear, and you really want to live a life of absolute surrender, where God has every compartment of your life under his lordship, then point number three is get at your wallet. Boom. Yes, I said it. And I don't apologize for that. Now, I'm not going to turn this into a tithing message. You know I don't do that. I've never spoken a full hour on it or whatever. But I am going to make a couple profound points and share a story, and then we're moving on, okay? So listen with an open mind here. There is something amazing about gratitude. Grateful people are people you want to be around. Bitter, negative, greedy, selfish people, not so much. The attitude of gratitude is not only contagious, it's godly. In fact, it's probably why the Apostle Paul wrote this. God loves a cheerful giver, not someone who's been beaten, not someone who gives out of guilt. And this isn't only about tithing. This is about our time and our talents and the gifts we have and the hours in our day. Are we willing to truly surrender those to the Lord? Because somehow, according to Scripture, joy, which we want, is somehow connected to giving. These two things are somehow connected. Now, if you lack joy in your life, give. If you lack peace and purpose and passion, give. Give your time, give your treasure, and give your talents. Ask yourself, don't say it out loud, does God have access to all three of those areas in your world? Only you can answer that. You see, this runs so different to what we think of in America, where we live in a society of accumulate of amassing things for us, trinkets and wealth and my precious, my shiny little toys and stuff. And we, we love our stuff. And we love taking all that God gives us and somehow we spend it all. And then we get to the end of the road here and we go, well, I don't have anything left to advance the kingdom. <laughs> Sorry about that, God. So we give God what's left over, not from our first fruits. One of the first things Amy and I do when God blesses us every time we're fortunate enough to receive a paycheck we don't, we don't question it. We don't wrestle with God. It is an act of joy. We write at least 10%, sometimes more, sometimes way more, whatever God leads us. But that was the minimum that he established. And it's not a battle we fight. If we have to fight that battle ahead of time, oh, I don't know if we, you know, we're looking at it. We will lose that battle. But it shows God who is first and foremost when he says you bring your first fruits, not your last fruits, not your rotted little apples with worms crawling out. That, oh, here you go. But the first fruits say, God, you gave it all. And here is a portion back. In fact, I liken it like this. Let me have a helper here. Who's somebody strong? We got a strong person? All right, come on up here, hockey guy. Here's what we're going to do. Corey's my helper today. I need you to hold this just like that. Good, and turn back just a little bit. What I want you to do is picture this, this bin right here, this bucket, is your life. Okay? And this picture represents God's blessings that he pours down on us every single day. Most of us are quite happy to receive these blessings every day without thinking. And that's normal. Most of us stop there. And we accumulate everything he's given without passing one blessing on to someone else. But what God really intended is as he blesses us, our life's not to be the bucket, it's to be the funnel. Where all of it pours through your hands as stewards but we let at least that 
go through. But all of this kept in the funnel, we get to decide. He gives us 100% and gives us 90% to live on with 10% showing him who is Lord. You want to know what's important to you? Look at your checkbook. You want to know what's important to somebody? You, can't, you don't even have to ask them a question. See where they spend their time. See where they invest their talents. Is it self-indulgent things? <laughs> Man, this is hard. Golly, Pastor, you didn't wait long to dive into this. Do you want to be this, this funnel? Or do you want to be this stopgap where every single thing we have stops with us? Where we just accumulate, my precious, it's fine. This is just me. It's just me, and now it's Corey's. Corey's, that's your souvenir, buddy. You can take that back to your seat if you want, all right? Don't say I didn't ever give you nothing. You see, if accumulating things in this world made people happy, then this man right here would be the happiest man alive. I'll give you a hint. His initials are HH. Anybody want to take a guess who that is? I am so glad no one said Hugh Hefner. That is awesome. This is Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes, totally different person than Hugh Hefner. Howard Hughes, by all accounts, had it all. If the secret to happiness in life was more, then this guy would go down in history as the, the happiest man, the most joy-filled, the most purpose-driven man in history. But he didn't. You see, all this guy wanted, according to Bill Hybels, all he ever wanted in life was more. He wanted more money. So he parlayed his family inheritance into a multi-billion dollar pile of assets, and it still wasn't enough. He was miserable, and he was looking for more. So he said, you know what? I want more fame. And this guy does the unthinkable. He breaks into the Hollywood movie scene, into their, their, their streamline of production and starts writing films and producing things and becomes a movie star himself. That's unheard of. And it still wasn't enough. He wanted more, uh, how do I say this? Um, sensual pleasures, okay? And he spent loads of money dreaming up and acting out every wicked urge he could think of and it still wasn't enough. He said, you know what, I want more power. And he began to secretly, behind the scenes, pull strings politically. So much so that not one, but two US presidents would become this guy's pawn. And it still wasn't enough. So he turned to thrills, he wanted more thrills, and he said, that's it, I'm gonna do something that's never been done. And he paid for, and he designed, and he built the largest aircraft in history. Anybody remember what this one's called? Spruce Goose, good job. If I remember right, this guy, he spent fortune on this. He gets in, and he, just to prove the naysayers wrong, he flies it down the river, and he pulls up, and the thing gets airborne for a few feet, and he lands it, and he parks it, and it never flies again. Just to say, I did it, and it was empty. It was like sawdust in his mouth. He was so empty that by the end of his life, after trying all these things, he ended up a sad, materialistic, hugging his trinkets, emaciated, sunken chest, colorless man with fingernails that had grown in these grotesque corkscrews with black rotting teeth and tumors all up and down his arms and track marks and, and, and puncture wounds from his drug addiction. All because he believed the myth that more and holding on to his empire would bring him the peace he was looking for. And it failed. The reason why is because it's giving that breaks the grip of more in our life. It's giving that does that. Do you feel those handcuffs? Do you feel those shackles? This is the lifestyle that Jesus talked about. It's one of his main themes. He comes on, he says, we read about the first early church. It was barely up and running when this was written about it in Acts 2. The church began selling their property, their possessions. They were sharing them with them all as anyone might have need. What? Do you see perhaps how far the modern church has drifted from that. Think about that. Giving and generosity in all areas of our life, the time, the treasure, the talents, is so risky on the surface, but it is so much more fulfilling, so much more freeing than a life of self-indulgent materialism. I want to share with you this story about a generous spirit that roared through Bayside Church in California. It's pastored by Ray Johnston. And they're over there on the West Coast, which we'll forgive them for that. But they launched this generosity campaign called Compassion First. And he challenged his church. He said, we're going to raise $2 million. And we're going to do it, and we're going to give it all away. We're going to give it away to Compassion First projects to help people do it locally, we're going to do it regionally, and we're going to do it worldwide. 25 projects they had highlighted on a map to give this fortune away. 
That's pretty awesome in and of itself. And he challenged everyone. He says, everybody's going to have a part. From the youngest ones, he brought out piggy banks, and he gave them to the youngest ones. To the teenagers, they collected hundreds of empty Pringles cans. And on the side, they wrote, stash the cash. And they could bring them to school. And anytime they had a couple singles, they would put them in there. Their goal, just the kids, was to raise $50,000 for this. And they did it like that. And everyone got into it. And they started challenging each other. And then the first person came to meet with the pastor that was an adult. And they said, we have just figured out how we're going to sacrifice. Y'all won't believe this. These people, this couple, had just accepted Christ three weeks earlier. And they came to him and they said, Pastor, we know what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. We're all in with this Jesus thing. So, okay, that sounds great. And we have decided that we're going to stop all our drinking, all our smoking, and all our extracurricular activities. And all the money that we were spending on those substances, we are going to give to the kingdom for the next three years. That pastor didn't know what to say other than give him a high five. That is, y'all, that's life change. When former drug addicts, when former people, only the Holy Spirit can free people like that and say, we're done. We're done. That was a lot of money. They didn't know that that could become a permanent beneficial lifestyle for them too. That was just gravy on top of it. Not to be outdone, the senior citizens heard about it and they came up and said, you know what? My husband is amazing. Her name was Cheryl. She said, I want you to know, pastor, I have the best husband. Now, anytime a pastor gets approached by anyone who brags like that, we immediately think there's something up. We think the wife has been, her Facebook page has been hacked or somebody has done something to put them up to it. And we say, okay, tell me more. And she said, my husband came to me and said, baby, I know I'm supposed to retire this year, but I've been praying about this. And I wanted to know if it's okay, instead of me retiring this year, if I worked two additional years and I gave everything to the Compassion First Fund. The wife couldn't believe it. She broke down and cried. She looked at the pastor. She said, tell me, tell me, tell me that God is still making godly men like this. Tell me the next generation is raising up leaders and followers that are surrendered and sold out to Christ. Well, not long after that, the pastor is, pro is approached by some teenagers. And the story was, they sat around the table. The dad had gathered them. He'd looked at the finances. They're sitting at their kitchen table. And he says, y'all, we want to support this, but I've looked at it, and there's just no way we can be sacrificially given. We might could give our time. We'll support it with our service, but we can't. We, it's just not there. And the 15-year-old said, what if we sacrifice? And the dad looked at her and said, well, what did you have in mind? Now, if you don't know 15-year-old girls these days, most of the time you will see the top of their head because they are doing this. Right? This is, their smartphone is their connection to life. It is their world. She took that phone and she said, how much would it save us if we could give, if I gave up my cell phone? How much would that save us in our bill? And the dad jokingly, not taking it seriously, said, that would probably pay the whole project right there, the amount you spend, the way you talk. And she said, okay, I'll do it. And set it in front of him. His jaw had not yet hit the table when she said, and what are you and mom going to sacrifice? They awkwardly looked at each other and said, should we? And they knew in their heart. They had been saving and putting aside cash to improve their older car for a slightly less older car, a newer to them car. And they said, you know what? We will do whatever it takes to make our existing vehicle go three more years. And we will give that to this, this ministry that will bring life to people. This family, who thought they had nothing to be able to contribute, ended up donating $18,000 to this project over the course of the months. They had nothing, or so they thought, but they were willing to sacrifice. But even the youngest kids got involved. And the way God answered their prayers was phenomenal. Buckle up. The kids, one of them had apparently done something amazing. And the pastor's secretary came in one morning, tears streaming. She was a happy, clappy girl, and so he knew something was wrong. And she come in trembling, and she sets this brown paper bag on his desk. And he goes, what's in there? <laughs> Why are you crying? She said, you need to look. And he looked, and he didn't know what was it. Was it a rat? I mean, what's in there? And he opens it up, and inside 
are crumpled up $1 bills with some change under it. And he's like, that is fantastic. Who's this from? And she said, keep going. There's a note. Y'all want to see what the note said? You curious? He opened this up, and inside was this note. Dear Pastor Ray, we really, really, really wanted to go to Disneyland, but we really think the Compassion First stuff is better. Here is all our money. Sincerely, Courtney and Misha, ages five and seven. Pastor broke down. He called his whole staff in, made them all read the note. They just wept. They just, what a beautiful reminder of the innocence of a child. Everything they wanted is embodied in Disney. And it's true. It's an awesome place. Ask Tabitha. She can hook you up. This is a fantastic thing. This is one of those things that it is, this is the brass ring for children. And they said the compassion first stuff's better. She, the pastor asked permission to show a note on PowerPoint the following Sunday. You think the story's over there? Oh, he put this note up on the screen. As God would have it, in the congregation that day was a senior executive from Disney who saw this and was moved. The following Monday morning, he calls the pastor's secretary and says, you go find that family and you tell them they have just blessed me and they have a full, free, seven-day scholarship to anywhere they want to go on us, all expense paid, seven days, and we're going to put them up in the nicest suite of the Disneyland Hotel. Now, what do you think that did to Courtney and Misha's faith? Their hearts were on fire. They were fully alive. You know how we know? Because their parents told us they went home and ran around the house looking for more things they could give to God. Who does this? This is incredible. The faith of a child on display. This is so amazing because giving breaks the grip of fear in our life and materialism and debt. I'm not promising you if you guys do this, you're going to get a trip to Disneyland, okay? Be awesome if you do. Take your pastor. It's cool. I'll make sure it's a spiritual experience. But what I am promising is if we are serious about sacrificial giving in every aspect of our life, this is not just about the money. If we do that, you will find that you will come fully alive and your faith will go to the next level. So what we're going to do is something that God laid on my heart like 24 hours ago. It's changed up my whole message and God has permission to do that. For the next eight weeks, we're going to do something we have never done before. I am launching a chance for you to practice point number three, a chance for us to practice radical generosity in many ways. The premier way we're going to do this is something that we just found, and it's called this right here. It's the Go, Give, Send, Go crowdfunding site, and we have set a goal, and this is not an ongoing campaign. This is not like a vision fund where it goes and goes. This is for you if you feel led to make a one-time one-time donation. This is going to last for eight weeks, and then it's over. We shut it down. We're going to see what God does to help us meet needs. See, right now, things are so tight that if we have people coming up needing assistance, needing help, even if they're church members or missionaries to spend, or the lady who needs her air conditioning fix, this widow living alone, or the young guy who doesn't have a place to stay for the night, right now, a lot of it's touch and go. I think I got a 20 here, and I think, you know, and, and, and we can't quite do this. We talk about meet the need, and we've got the bulletin boards, and it's great, and it's good. But today, the worst thing I could do is challenge us to do more and never give you a chance to do it. So this is a free site. They don't even take a cent. This isn't like an Indiegogo or Kickstarter where they keep a big portion. 100% of everything you and anyone you share this link with, this is where it goes, to the ministry, the missions, and more fund. So we're going to call it the MMM Fund. Now, if you're not a computer person, you can go there right now, by the way. It's okay if you get your smartphone out. It just became live today. It's only open for 60 days. Share this on your social media. All you got to do is click it. Go to our website. It's on the website if you're not a social media person. It's going to be on Facebook by the end of today, and you can share this with your friends. And if you're not into the technological thing, all you have to do is write MMM in the portion of your check, and you can put it in a treasure chest. MMM, Ministry, Missions, and More. Okay? So this is your chance to do that. Please like this and please share that. Now, we want to be able to respond at a moment's notice, and that's what this fund can do. But I saved the most important part for last. Point number four, 
to conquering this demon of doubt and fear in our lives is start praying some dangerous prayers. Woo! Start praying some dangerous prayers. You see, let's be honest. We are not used to praying dangerous prayers. We're used to praying safe prayers. We pray for things we know God can do. We pray for things that are within the realm of possibility. God, increase my faith, but not so much that it's uncomfortable. <laughs> God, I want you to blow people's minds. I want you to, not, not in my life. <laughs> I meant blow their minds, Lord, right? This is, this, is, this is how we work. Do something awesome, but just don't scare me with it. And we're afraid to pray risky prayers. But I save this for last because this is where the power lies. It's not in our flesh. It's not in only our wallet. It's not in risking and knowing that there are great things out there to do and being obedient. It comes through God's anointing. And perhaps the most dangerous prayer that we can pray is four simple words. Write them down. Thy will be done. Not my will. Not your will. Thy will. Thy will be done. When we pray that and we surrender in total obedience, we start praying dangerous prayers more and more often. God, what do you want? And we start praying according to his spirit leading. And then we start listening for the call of God and acting on what he tells us. There's a great book called, If You Want to Walk on Water, You Have to Get Out of the Boat. John Ortberg wrote it. And he shares this amazing story about a man named Doug. And Doug is this guy who works in Washington, D.C. We never know his last name. He's in D.C., and he's there with all the big wigs and the Capitol buildings and all the fancy monuments and stuff. And what he does is he disciples believers, and he leads a corporate Bible study a couple times a week. And all these people come and visit, and he starts to share his faith, and he's kind of like this spiritual shepherd. He's just a businessman. In one of his classes, one of his Bible studies, walks another man named Bob. Okay, so we got Doug, the leader, and we got Bob. He's an insurance salesman. Okay, terribly exciting guy named Bob. All we know is his name's Bob. And he comes in, and Bob accepts Christ. And he starts coming to this Bible study more and more, trying to be discipled by Doug. One day, Bob comes rushing into the Bible study. He says, stop teaching, stop teaching. I have a question. I got to know, is this true? Is this true? What, what, is what true? Tell us. He said, I've been reading the scriptures, and I'm reading where Jesus says, ask whatever you will in my name, and you shall receive it. And I want to know, is that really true? And Doug said, well, it depends on what you're thinking. It's it's not a blank check, and God's not a genie. You know, God, I believe you want a Ferrari for me today. I expect it in the parking lot when I leave. You know, oh, it didn't come through. That's Santa Claus. That's not God. But if you do pray it according to his will, he is going to hear your prayers. Because God wants nothing more than his will to be done. Why Jesus himself said, your will be done. Nevertheless, not my own. And Bob got so excited, he says, all right then, I'm going to pray for Kenya because that's what my church is doing a compassion fund about. For Kenya. Okay, that sounds great. Do you know anyone in Kenya? Nope. Doug said, all right, cool. Well, here's what we're going to do. We'll hold each other accountable. I want you to pray every day for six months for Kenya. I want you to pray bold prayers, risky prayers, prayers that couldn't possibly happen in human intellectual logic to explain them. Will you do that? Well, that's an awful long time. Tell you what, if you do it, me and my businessmen will donate $500 to your cause. If God doesn't do anything extraordinary during those 500 days, we'll pay you that. But here's the catch. If you hear or catch wind of God doing something amazing, extraordinary in those 500 days that you can't explain, then you got to give $500 to the ministry of your choice. It's a friendly charitable wager. He said, deal, done. And in all honesty, Bob started to pray, and he said for weeks and weeks, not much happened. Then one night, He's at a charity dinner, and he's seated at one of those awkward round tables where you don't know anyone. They got your name tag, and you're sitting there with people you've never met. They're going around the room, and they're talking, and they're awkwardly making this chit-chat, and the lady on the far side gets to introduce herself, and she says, I run an orphanage. Oh, that's nice. It's in Kenya, and it's the biggest one of its kind, and the needs are great. And Bob almost choked on his fork and said, tell me more. Tell me about Kenya. He goes on and he starts peppering her with questions. And she says, time out. <laughs> Sir, I perceive you have a big interest in Kenya. Can you tell me what this is about? And he says, absolutely. I just, it's been on my heart. She goes, oh, you have family in Kenya. He says, no. You know somebody in Kenya, in my country. Nope. You've been to Kenya. 
Nope, couldn't point it out on a map. Why are you so interested? God just laid us on my heart. He said, sir, would you like to come to Kenya and see this for yourself? What you've been praying for? I don't know. I did. Yes, absolutely. Bob was on a plane. They land in Kenya, and they see this orphanage, and right away, he starts to break down. He sees the needs. He sees abject poverty. He sees things that are so just assumed and taken for granted in his rich life. And he says, this can't happen. And he goes back home, and he begins to write letters to every big wig he can think of, pharmaceutical companies, medical companies. Would you please, the need is great. Would you please respond? Do it, do it. Just throwing out risky prayers and risky letters, making an impact. Some time goes by, and the woman calls up Bob and says, Bob, something amazing is happening. Are you behind this? We have been receiving the most phenomenal gifts because of letters some man is writing back in America. The orphanage has received to date more than $1 million of life-saving free medical supplies. If this was you, thank you. But we want to do more than that. Would you please fly back over here and let us celebrate the goodness of God? Would you please come back? Oh, man, I don't know. Yes, absolutely. Bob gets on a plane. He flies. He lands back. The orphanage is open, and people are being healed, and there's all kinds of life-saving stuff happening. The president of Nairobi, of, of Kenya, shows up at this orphanage because he's heard about what God is doing in this place, and he wants to meet this man named Bob. The president comes. Bob is blown away, gets introduced. The president looks at Bob and says, would you like a personal tour of my city, of Nairobi, of the capital? It would be an honor to give such a good man a personal tour of my city. Bob's like, absolutely. And they go around all the capital city, and Bob's getting this great tour, and they're going, they're seeing all the great monuments and all the heights and the palaces and stuff, and they go by a prison. And Bob remarks about some prisoners he sees in the courtyard. And he says, what's that? And he says, oh, those are political prisoners who spoke out against me and the government. Bob, without thinking, said, oh, yeah, that's a bad idea. You should let them out. Not thinking any more of it, Bob finishes the ceremony, finishes the celebration, gets on a plane, and goes home. Not thinking anything else, a few weeks pass, and he gets a phone call that makes his blood drain out of his face. It's from the State Department of the United States government. And they began to pepper him with questions, uncomfortable questions. The first one was, sir, were you recently in Kenya? <laughs> yeah. Did you seriously make a statement to the president of Kenya? about political prisoners, which you knew nothing about? Yeah. I need to know exactly what you said. I said, that's bad. You should let them out. <laughs> Sir, do you have any idea how long we have been working behind the scenes to get them out of prison? Do you know how hard we have been working to no avail for years to get these political prisoners, these Americans released, and every single attempt has failed? And then, inexplicably, we get a call from Nairobi that says, come get your prisoners. All of them are free. And the State Department asked why. And they said it was because of some guy named Bob. <laughs> some guy named Bob. One guy named Bob who loved God and loved people more than his own comforts and his own safety and was willing to be risky. Wow, what about us? I want to be like Bob. <laughs> be like Bob. This is incredible. He prayed risky prayers, bold prayers. He started believing God is alive and he's not done working and he's not done in, in this world. One guy who dared to pray dangerous prayers. One guy who got out of the boat, who got out of his wallet because he realized what was at stake. And today, we're going to do just that. We're not going to sing a song. We're not going to have an invitation. Jason, wherever you are, you can hop up there, buddy. And what I'm going to do is I'd like to call us to prayer, and we're going to end that way. I want to pray for you, and I want to give you a chance. So today, if you're physically able, will you join me at the altar? And if you're not, maybe you can make your way to the front rows, and you can sit there as we pray. God, hears your prayer wherever you are, if it's uncomfortable for you. But if you can make it, there's something special about unity and humility when we kneel before God, when we come together as a church, okay? So let's stand together, and if God has moved in your heart in any way, you want to thank him for something, let's move forward, kneel beside me here. We're going to pray bold, risky, outside our comfort zone prayers, and we're going to give our surrender to the Lord here today.